from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Hill and the Hole by Fritz Lieber Tom Digby swabbed his face against the rolled-up sleeve of his drill shirt and good-naturedly damned the whole practice of measuring altitudes with barometric instruments. Now that he was back at the benchmark, which was 511 feet above sea level, he could see that his reading for the height of the hill was ridiculously off. It figured out to about 447 feet whereas the hill in plain view, hardly a quarter of a mile away, was obviously somewhere around 570 or even 580. The discrepancy made it a pit instead of a hill. Evidently, either he or the altimeter had been cockeyed when he had taken the reading at the hilltop, and since the altimeter was working well enough now, it looked as if he had been the one. He would have liked to get away early for lunch with Ben Shelley at Beltonville, but he needed this reading to finish off the oil survey. He had not been able to spot the sandstone limestone contact he was looking for anywhere but near the top of this particular hill. So he picked up the altimeter, stepped out of the cool shadow of the barn behind which the benchmark was located and trudged off. He figured he would be able to finish his little job properly and still be in time for Ben. A grin came to his big square youthful face as he thought of how they would chew the fat and josh each other. Ben, like himself, was on the State Geologic Survey. Fields of shoulder-high corn, dazzling green under the broiling midwestern sun, stretched away from the hill to the flat horizon. The noonday hush was beginning. Blue-bottle flies droned around him as he skirted a manure heap and slid between the weather-gray rails of an old fence. There was no movement except a vague breeze rippling the corn a couple of fields away, and a farmer's car raising a lazy trail of dust far off in the opposite direction. The chunky, competent-looking figure of Tom Digby was the only thing with purpose in the whole landscape. When he had pushed through the fringe of tall, dry stock weeds at the base of the hill, he glanced back at the shabby, one-horse farm where the benchmark was located. It looked deserted. Then he made out a little tow-headed girl watching him around the corner of the barn, and he remembered having noticed her earlier. He waved and chuckled when she dodged back out of sight. Sometimes these farmer's kids were mighty shy. Then he started up the hill at a brisker pace toward where the bit of strata was so invitingly exposed. When he reached the top, he did not get the breeze he expected. It seemed, if anything, more stiflingly hot than it had been down below, and there was a feeling of dustiness. He swabbed at his face again, set down the altimeter on a level spot, carefully twisted off the dial until the needle stood directly over the middle line of the scale and started to take the reading from the pointer below. Then his face clouded. He felt compelled to joggle the instrument, although he knew it was no use. Forcing himself to work very slowly and methodically, he took a second reading. The result was the same as the first. When he stood up and relieved his feelings with a fancy bit of swearing, more vigorous, but just as good-natured as the blast he had let off at the benchmark. Allowing for any possible change in barometric pressure during the short period of his climb up from the benchmark, the altimeter still gave the height of the hill as under 450. Even a tornado of fantastic severity could not account for such a difference in pressure. It would not have been so bad, he told himself disgustedly, if he had not been using an old-fashioned aneroid. But a $500 altimeter of the latest design is not supposed to be temperamental. However, there was nothing to do about it now. 
The altimeter had evidently given its last accurate gasp at the benchmark and gone bluey for good. It would have to be shipped back east to be fixed, and he would have to get along without this particular reading. He flopped down for a breather before starting back. As he looked out over the checkerboard of fields and the larger checkerboard of sections bounded by dirt roads, it occurred to him how little most people knew about the actual dimensions and boundaries of the world they lived in. They looked at straight lines and a map and innocently supposed they were straight in reality. They might live all their lives believing their homes were in one county when accurate surveying would show them to be in another. They were genuinely startled if you explained that the Mason-Dixon line had more jags in it than a rail fence, or if you told them that it was next to impossible to find an accurate and up-to-date detail map of any given district. They did not know how rivers jumped back and forth putting bits of land first in one state and then in another. They had never followed fine-looking, reassuring roads that disappeared into a reedy nowhere. They went along believing that they lived in a world as neat as a geometry book diagram, while chaps like himself and Ben went around patching the edges together and seeing to it that one mile plus one mile equaled at least something like two miles, or proving that hills were really hills and not pits in the skies. It suddenly seemed devilishly hot and close and the bare ground unpleasantly gritty. He tugged at his collar, unbuttoned it further. Time to be getting on to Beltonville. A couple glasses of iced coffee would do good. He hitched himself up and noticed that the little girl had come out from behind the barn again. She seemed to be waving at him now with a queer jerky beckoning movement that was probably just the effect of the heat shimmer rising from the fields. He waved too, and the movement brought on an abrupt spell of dizziness. A shadow seemed to surge across the landscape, and he had difficulty in breathing. Then he started down the hill, and pretty soon he was feeling all right again. I was a fool to come this far without a hat, he told himself. This sun will get you, even if you're as healthy as a horse. Something was nagging at his mind. However, as he realized when he got down in the corn again, it was that he did not like the idea of letting the hill lick him. It occurred to him that he might persuade Ben to come over this afternoon, if he had nothing else to do, and get a precise measurement with all it died and plane available. When he neared the farm, he saw that the little girl had retreated again to the corner of the barn. He gave her a friendly, hello. She did not answer, but she did not run away either. He became aware that she was staring at him in an intent, appraising way. You live here, he asked. She did not answer. After a while, she said, What did you want to go down there for? The state hires me to measure land, he replied. He had reached the benchmark and was automatically starting to take a reading before he remembered that the altimeter was useless. This is your father's farm, he asked. Again, she did not answer. She was barefooted and wore a cotton dress of washed-out blue. The sun had bleached her hair and eyebrows several degrees lighter than her skin, giving something of the effect of a photographic negative. Her mouth hung open. Her whole face had a vacuous yet not exactly stupid expression. Finally, she shook her head solemnly and said, You shouldn't have gone down there. You might not have been able to get out again. Say, just what are you talking about, he inquired, humorously just keeping his voice gentle so she would not run away. The hole, she answered. Tom Digby felt a shiver run over him. Sun must have hit me harder than I thought, he told himself. You mean there's some sort of pit down that way, he asked quickly? Maybe an old well or cesspool hidden in the weeds? Well, I didn't fall in. Is it on this side of the hill? He was still on his knees besides the benchmark. A look of understanding mixed with a slight disappointment came over her face. She nodded wildly and observed, You're just like Papa. He's always telling me there's a hill there, so I won't be scared of the hole. But he doesn't need to. I know all about it, and I wouldn't go near it again for anything. Say, what the dickens are you talking about? 
His voice got out of control and he rather boomed the question at her. But she did not dart away, only continued to stare at him thoughtfully. Maybe I've been wrong, she observed finally. Maybe Papa and you and other people really do see a hill there. Maybe they make you see a hill there, so you won't know about them being there. They don't like to be bothered, I know. There was a man come up here about two years ago trying to find out about them. He had a kind of spyglass on sticks. They made him dead. That was why I didn't want you to go down there. I was afraid they would do the same thing to you. He disregarded the shiver that was creeping persistently along his spine, just as he had disregarded from the very beginning with automatic scientific distaste for eeriness, the coincidence between the girl's fancy and the inaccurate ultimate readings. Who are they? he asked carefully. Little girl's blank, watery blue eyes stared past him as if she were looking at nothing or everything. They are dead. Bones. Just bones. But they move around. They live at the bottom of the hole. And they do things there. Yes, he prompted, feeling a trifle guilty at encouraging her. From the corner of his eye, he could see an old Model T chugging up the rutted drive, raising clouds of dust. When I was little, she continued in a low voice, so he had to listen hard to catch the words. I used to go right up to the edge and look down at them. There's a way to climb down in, but I never did. Then one day, they looked up and caught me spying. Just white bone faces, everything else black. I knew they were thinking of making me dead, so I ran away and never went back. The Model T rattled to a stop beside the barn, and a tall man in blue, blue overalls swung out and strode swiftly toward them. School board sent you over, he shot accusingly at Tom. You from the county hospital? He clamped his big jaw round the girl's hand. He had the same bleached hair and eyebrows, but his face was burnt to a brick red. There was a strong facial resemblance. I want to tell you something, he went on, his voice heavy with anger but under control. My little girl's all right in the head. It's up to me to judge, isn't it? What if she don't always give the answers the teachers expect? She's got a mind of her own, hasn't she? And I'm perfectly fit to take care of her. I don't like the idea of your sneaking around to put a lot of questions to her while I'm gone. Then his eye fell on the altimeter. He glanced at Tom sharply, especially at the riding breeches and high-laced boots. I guess I went and made a damn fool of myself, he said swiftly. You an oil man? Tom got to his feet. I'm in the state geologic survey, he said. The farmer's manner changed completely. He stepped forward, his voice was confidential. But you saw signs of oil here, didn't you? Tom shrugged his shoulders and grinned pleasantly. He had heard a hundred farmers ask the same question in the same way. I couldn't say anything about that. I'd have to finish my mapping before I could make any guesses. The farmer smiled back, knowingly but not unfriendly. I know what you mean, he said. I know you fellows got orders not to talk. So long, mister. Tom said, so long, not a goodbye to the little girl, who was still gazing at him steadily and rocked around the barn to his own car. As he plumped the altimeter down on the front seat beside him, he yielded to the impulse to take another reading. Once more he swore, this time under his breath. The altimeter seemed to be working properly again. Well, he told himself, that settles it. I'll come back and get a reliable holiday tomorrow. If not with Ben, then with somebody else. I'll nail that hill down before I do anything. Ben Shelley slumped down the last drops of coffee, pushed back from the table, and thumbed tobacco into his battered brier. Tom explained his proposition. A wooden-bladed fan was wheezing ponderously overhead, causing pendant stripes of flypaper to sway and tremble. Hold on a minute, Ben interrupted near the end. That reminds me of something I was bringing over for you. May save us the trouble. And he fished in his briefcase. You don't mean to tell me there's some map for this region I didn't know about. The tragic disgust in Tom's voice was only half jocular. 
They swore up and down to me at the office there wasn't. Yeah, I'm afraid I mean just that, Ben confirmed. Here she is, a special topographic job, only issued yesterday. Tom snatched the folded sheet. You're right, he proclaimed a few moments later. This might have been some help to me. His voice became sarcastic. I wonder what they wanted to keep it a mystery for. Oh, you know how it is, said Ben easily. They take a long time getting maps out. The work for this was done two years ago, before you were on the survey. It's rather an unusual map. A person you talked to at the office probably didn't connect it up with your structural job. And there's a yarn about it, which might explain why there was some confusion. Tom had pushed the dishes away and was studying the map intently. Now he gave a muffled exclamation which made Ben look up. Then he hurriedly reinspected the whole map and the printed material in the corner. Then he stared at one spot for so long that Ben chuckled and said, What have you found? A gold mine? Tom turned a serious face on him. Look, Ben, he said slowly. This map is no good. There's a terrible mistake in it. Then he added, it looks as if they did some of the readings by sighting through a rolled up newspaper at a yardstick. I knew you wouldn't be happy until you found something wrong with it, said Ben. Can't say I blame you. What is it? Tom slid the map across him, indicating one spot with his thumbnail. Just read that off to me, he directed. What do you see there? Ben paused while he lit his pipe, eyeing the map. Then he answered promptly. An elevation of 441 feet. And it's got a name lettered in the hole. Poetic, aren't we? Well, what is it? A stone quarry? Ben, I was out at that very spot this morning, said Tom. And there isn't any depression there at all, but a hill. This reading is merely off some tripod of 140 feet. Go on, countered Ben. You were somewhere else this morning. Got mixed up. I've done it myself. Tom shook his head. There's a 511-foot benchmark right next door to it. Then you got an old benchmark. Ben was immediately skeptical. You know, one of the pre-Columbus ones? Oh, rot. Look, Ben, how about coming out with me this afternoon and we'll shoot it with your Alidade? I've got to do it sometime or other anyway, now that my altimeter's out of whack. And I'll prove to you this map is chock full of errors. How about it? Ben applied another match to his pipe. He nodded. All right, I'm game. But don't be angry when you find you turned in at the wrong farm. It was not until they were rolling along the highway with Ben's equipment in the back seat that Tom remembered something. Say, Ben, didn't you start to tell me about a yarn connected with this map? Doesn't mount to much, really. Just that the surveyor, an old chap named Walcraftston, died of heart failure while he was still in the field. At first they thought someone would have to redo the job, but later, when they went over his papers, they found that he had completed it. Maybe that explains why some of the people at the office were in doubt as to whether there was such a map. Tom was concentrating on the road ahead. They were getting near the turnoff. That would have been about two years ago, he asked. I mean, when he died? Uh-huh. Or two and a half. It happened somewhere around here, and there was some kind of stupid mess about it. I seem to remember that a full county coroner, a local Sherlock Holmes, said there were signs of strangulation or suffocation or some other awful nonsense, and wanted to hold Walcraftson's Rodman. Of course, we put a stop to that. Tom did not answer. Certain words he had heard a couple of hours earlier were coming back to him, just as if a phonograph had been turned on. Two years ago there was a man come up here trying to find out about them. He had a kind of spyglass on sticks. They made him dead. That's why I didn't want you to go down there. I was afraid. They would do the same thing to you. He angrily shut his mind to those words. If there was anything he detested it was admitting the possibility of supernatural agencies, even in jest. Anyway, what difference did her words make? After all, a man had really died. It was only natural that her defective imagination should cook up some wild fancy. Of course, as he had to admit, the screwy entry on the map 
made one more coincidence counting the girl's story and the cockeyed altimeter readings was the first. But was it so much of a coincidence? Perhaps while Craftsman had listened to the girls prattling and noted down the whole and the reading for it as a kind of private joke, intending to erase it later. Besides, what difference did it make if there had been two genuine coincidences? The universe was full of them. Every molecular collision was a coincidence. You could pile a thousand coincidences on top of another, you averred, and not get Tom Digby one step nearer to believing the supernatural. Oh, he knew intelligent people enough, all right, who coddled such beliefs. Some of his best friends liked to create yarns and toy with eerie possibilities for the sake of a thrill. But the only emotion Tom ever got out of such stuff was a nauseating disgust. It cut too deep for joking. It was a reversion to that primitive fear-bound ignorance from which science has slowly lifted man, inch by inch, against the most bitter opposition. Take the silly matter about the hill. Once admit that the dimensions of a thing might not be real, down to the last fraction of an inch, and you cut the foundations from under the world. He'd be damned, he told himself, if he ever told anyone the whole story of the altimeter readings. It was just a silly sort of yarn that Ben, for instance, would like to play around with. Well, he'd have to do without it. With a feeling of relief, he turned off for the farm. He had worked himself up into quite an angry state of mind, and part of the anger was at himself for even bothering to think about such matters. Now they would finish it off neatly, as scientists should, without leaving any loose ends around for morbid imaginations to knit together. He led Ben back to the barn and indicated the benchmark and the hill. Ben got his bearings, studied the map, inspected the benchmark closely, then studied the map again. Finally, he turned with an apologetic grin. You're absolutely right. This map is as screwy as a surrealist painting, at least as far as that hill is concerned. I'll go around to the car and get my stuff. We can shoot its altitude from right off the benchmark. He paused, frowning. Gosh, though, I can't understand how Wolkowston ever got it so screwed up. Probably they misinterpreted something on his original manuscript map. I suppose that must have been it. After they had set up the plane table and telescope-like alidade directly over the benchmark, Tom shouldered the rod with its inset level and conspicuous markings. I'll go up there and be rod man for you, he said. I'd like you to shoot this yourself. Then they won't have any comeback when you walk into the office and blow them up for issuing such a map. Okay, Ben answered laughing. I'll look forward to doing that. Tom noticed the farmer coming toward them from the field ahead. He was relieved to see that the little girl was not with him. As they passed one another, the farmer winked triumphantly at him. Found something worth coming back for, huh? Tom did not answer, but the farmer's manner tickled his sense of humor, and he found himself feeling pretty good, all irritation gone as he stepped along toward the hill. The farmer introduced himself to Ben by saying, Found signs of a pretty big gusher, huh? His pretense at being matter-of-fact was not convincing. I don't know anything about it, Ben answered carefully. He just roped me in to help him take a reading. The farmer cocked his big head and looked sideways at Ben. My, you stay fellows are pretty close mouth, aren't you? Well, you didn't worry, because I know there's oil under here. Five years ago, a fellow took a drilling lease on all my land at a dollar a year. But then... He never showed up again. Of course, I know what happened. The big companies bought him out. They know there's oil under here, but they won't drill. Want to keep the price of gasoline up. Ben made a non-committal sound and busied himself loading his pipe. Then he sighted through the Aladad at Tom's back for no particular reason. The farmer's gaze swung out in the same direction. Well, that's a funny thing now, come to think of it, he said. Right out where he's going is where that other chap keeled over a couple of years ago. Ben's interest quickened. A surveyor named Walcraftson? Something like that. It happened right on top of that hill. They'd been fooling around here all day. Something gone wrong with the instruments. The other chap said, Of course, I knew they found signs of oil and didn't want to let on. 
along toward evening the old chap well crapson like you said took the pole out there himself the other chap had done it twice before and stood atop the hill it was right then he keeled over we run out there but it was too late hart got him he must have thrashed around a lot before he died though because he was all covered with dust ben grunted appreciatively wasn't there some question about it afterward oh our coroner made a fool of himself as he generally does but i stepped in and told exactly what happened and that settled it say mister why don't you break down and tell me what you know about the oil under there ben's protestations of total ignorance on the subject were cut short by the sudden appearance of a little tall-headed girl from the direction of the road she had been running she gasped papa and grabbed the farmer's hand ben walked over towards the aladid he could see the figure of tom emerging from the tall weeds and starting up the hill then his attention was caught by what the girl was saying you've got to stop him papa she was dragging her father's wrist you can't let him go down in the hole they got it fixed to make him dead this time shut your mouth sue the farmer shouted down at her his voice more anxious and angry you'll get me into trouble with the school board that queer things you say that man's just going out there to find out how high the hill is but papa can't you see she twisted away and pointed at tom's steadily mounting figure he's already started down in they're set up to trap him squatting down there in the dark all quiet so he won't hear their bones scraping together stop him papa with an apprehensive look at ben the farmer got down on his knees beside the little girl and put his arm around her look sue you're a big girl now he argued it don't do for you to talk that way i know you're just playing but other people don't know you so well they might think you know certain things you wouldn't want them to take you away from me would you he was twisting from side to side in his arms trying to catch a glimpse of tom over his shoulder suddenly with an unexpected backward lunge she jerked loose and ran off toward the hill the farmer got to his feet and lumbered after her calling stop sue stop crazy as a couple of hoot owls ben decided watching them go both of them think there's something under the ground one says oil the other says ghosts you pay your money and you take your choice then he noticed that during the excitement tom had gotten to the top of the hill and had the rod up he hurriedly sighted through the aladad which was in the direction of the hilltop for some reason he could not see anything through it just blackness he felt forward to make sure the lens cover was off he swung it around a little hoping something had not dropped out of place inside the tube then abruptly through it he caught sight of tom and involuntarily he uttered a short frightened cry and jumped away on the hilltop tom was no longer in sight ben stood still for a moment then he raced for the hill at top speed he found the farmer looking around perplexedly near the far fence come on ben gasped out there's trouble and vaulted over when they reached the hilltop ben stooped to the sprawling body then recoiled with a convulsive movement and for a second time uttered a smothered cry for every square inch of skin and clothes was smeared with a fine dark gray dust and close beside one gray hand was a tiny white bone because a certain hideous vision still dominated his memory ben needed no one to tell him that it was a bone from a human finger he buried his face in his hands fighting that vision for what he had seen or thought he had seen through the aladad had been a tiny struggling figure of tom buried in darkness with dim skeletal figures clutching him all around and dragging him down into a thicker blackness the farmer kneeled by the body dead as dead he muttered in a hushed voice just like the other he's got the stuff fairly rubbed into him it's even in his mouth and nose like he's been buried in ashes and then dug up from between the rails of the fence the little girl stared up at them terrified but avid